very much for all of that. We have a lot of names I'm juggling this morning. Uh, let's bring in CNN senior political analyst John Avalon, CNN senior writer and analyst who predicted the win, Harry Anton, mm -hmm. and CNN White House correspondent Abby Phillip. Great to have all of you, Harry. Did you predict this win? Well, I will say I went to Don Lemon's executive producer as soon as the polls closed and I realized what was going on and said, you better keep an eye out on this race. We didn't want to have a situation like last week where we were so taken aback by Gilliams. But how did you know when the polls closed that she was going to win? I mean, the first votes that came in were from outside of Boston and she was running very neck and neck. And we knew that Presley was going to do particularly well inside of Boston because she has been a long time city councilwoman there. And so when she was close outside of Boston, it's pretty clear. She okay, but, but the bigger yeah. picture is that she ran, she's a progressive, and she ran against a 10-term ten ten incumbent progressive. Yeah. So what is the message here? That even if you're a progressive but an incumbent, you're not safe. Well, I think that's part of it. And yeah, Capuano is one of the most liberal members of the House Democratic Caucus. But it's more than that. This is a majority-minority district. She is a minority. She's an African-American woman. Michael Capuano is a white man. And to be a white man in Democratic primaries this year has simply not been a recipe for success. The Democratic base, which is women, and it's increasingly minority women want people in Congress to represent them who look like them. Harry, not only are you calling elections, but also apparently producing our overnight broadcast. So we thank you. <laughs> we thank you for all of that. And as much as I would like to make this about the Commonwealth of Massachusetts and really everything about the yes. Commonwealth of Massachusetts, I think this is something much bigger. And, and Abby, as, as I look at this and I look what the Democratic Party is doing and increasingly female candidates, minority candidates are winning in these contested elections. It makes me wonder where things will go in 2020. We have a field of Democratic contenders vying for the primary. What does this tell you about what Democratic primary voters might want going forward? Well, it seems pretty clear that Democrats are trying to elect people who look more like their constituents, who look more like the districts that they're trying to serve. Uh, the, the commonality between Ayanna Presley and uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez is that they are people who were able to topple longtime incumbents who May, may have voted in a way that their district liked over the years, but had come to not look like their district in some key ways, not have the sort of background that, that I, that their voters identify with. And this has been a tension for Democrats for quite some time, but it really became, uh, it really became an, a, a huge issue, even at the national stage in 2016, when, you know, I was on the campaign trail as a reporter hearing from a lot of minority Democrats, many of whom um, may not have voted in that race uh, to Hillary Clinton's detriment, that they wanted their party to be more responsive to them. So I think in some ways the Democratic Party is heeding that message, but they're doing it in the districts uh, where they can afford to, in the districts that are not likely mm. to flip mm. to Republicans. Uh, and you're not necessarily seeing, uh, with the exception of Andrew Gillum in Florida, which is a, mm. a huge, yeah, huge race, yeah. but you're seeing these things happening in places where Democrats are, are having this conversation amongst themselves, uh, not necessarily uh, in the places where they are then going up against Republicans in the fall in districts uh, that might be more purple or might be uh, more on the margin. But let, let's just take a look at, at the last two big races. Andrew Gilman, Florida. The polling had him at 16% in the most recent poll before. And he, he, he won in a crowded field with almost twice that. The WBUR poll in Boston had, had, her, uh, had Presley trailing Capuano by around 12, 13 points in early August, basically the same as it was in February. So there's no question the energies on the progressive populist left. Um, but it's also not being fully picked up in polls. And that's a, that is just a, not only a sign of coming attractions for where the Democratic Party's headed, but for the remaining primaries that are there. Now, whether that'll translate to general election wins, in Presley's case, there is no general election. <laughs> Harry, literally. Yeah, Harry, I see that as your fault. Yeah, um, because just blame me. My mother blames me. I blame you Why not? because you crunch the numbers, you look at the polls, and look, you and I have talked about this before. American, many voters do not trust the polls right now. And when you have a, you know, to her, that he's, that hey, hey. she's 12 points behind the incumbent, but then she wins, explain. Sure, I mean, look, Steve Cosella, who ran that poll out of Boston, is a very good pollster, and that poll was taken over a month ago. That, that said, I do think that there was probably some uncaptured momentum that she had in the final days of that campaign, even if there was a poll that was taken. But look, Polls are imperfect. Polls are especially imperfect in primary seasons. And that's why we have to be careful when we're talking about the fall campaign yeah. that we speak about a margin of error. You know, if a Democrat's ahead by four, Republicans ahead by four, that's far from a guaranteed victory, especially in a midterm election where turnout 
turnout turnout is a story. Well, I, I really don't think this is a polling story. I, I think this is a momentum story and where the energy is in the party story. And if the poll had been taken three days ago, I think you would have seen a different story in Massachusetts. Sure. I am fascinated about what this means in a general election. And Abby did touch on this before. And really, the one race where this matters, every race matters. But in Florida, Andrew Gillum, you have someone who won this type of primary and is now facing a contested general election. I just want to tell people we have some visibility on where this race stands right, right now. Yeah. This is from Quinnipiac. He's actually leading the Republican Ron DeSantis, the Trump-like congressman there. Really close. I mean, it's within the margin of error. But the question, Abby, and we don't know the answer yet, is how will these more progressive candidates do in the fall? Do you have a sense of how the White House and Republicans feel about facing more progressive candidates? Well, I think Harry's uh, or your point earlier is correct. It's about energy. This is about uh, how much are these candidates, someone like Andrew Gillum, going to motivate people who uh, might not normally vote in a gubernatorial race to come out and do that. Uh, but he also has to do that in addition to motivating uh, more generic uh, um, gubernatorial voters. So he's going to have to do both things simultaneously. Mm -hmm. And I think that's why there's some uncertainty here on the part of Republicans about what's going to happen in races like this, because they're not seeing the same kind of energy on their end of the, the ledger. And uh, one of the things that they know really well is that, uh, you know, Donald Trump surprised them yeah. because a lot of people who they didn't expect to come out and vote did come out and vote, especially in places like Florida, where, where in some cases, Donald Trump's margin was so narrow because you had a lot of white rural voters coming out right. to the ballots. And I think if Democrats see that on the other side, that is not going to be a good sign for Republicans. But that being said, I think the party is really clear eyed about mm -hmm. this problem. The only person who maybe not is President Trump himself. All right. Thank you, Abby, Harry, John, very much. Obviously, we'll be covering all the developments More through the program. Yeah, no, no one happier that we're talking about a primary race in Massachusetts. No one happier than President Donald Trump this morning. <laughs> the president is in her circle trying desperately to discredit Bob Woodward over his damning new book, portraying a chaotic presidency on the edge of a nervous breakdown. Those are the words inside the book. CNN special correspondent Jamie Gangel, she's read the book. She joins us now live from Washington with much more, and there is much more, Jamie. So one of the things we've talked about, the papers being stolen, we've talked about the Russia investigation, but we also, for the first time, get a glimpse behind the scenes of what was going on about Charlottesville, how the White House staff got President Trump to come out, clean up his remarks. You see uh, former Staff Secretary Rob Porter in the White House residence on his laptop, convincing the president to change his remarks. The president is reluctant. He says, I don't know. This doesn't feel right to me. He gives that speech. We've, we've sort of described it. He looks grim, hostage. He comes off the air. And what we now know, according to Woodward's book, is what does he do? He goes up to the residence. He turns on the television. And Fox News, uh, Kevin Quirk, the correspondent, says the president just made a course correction. What happens? President Trump goes ballistic. He explodes and says, that was the biggest effing mistake I've ever made. You never make those concessions. You never apologize. I didn't do anything wrong in the first place. Why look weak? And so we now know that was what was behind the thoughts he was having, according to Woodward's book, when he goes to Trump Tower and doubles down. And the other thing that Woodward reports is the fallout from the Trump Tower speech, which is that the staff was so upset that Chief of Staff John Kelly is reported in the book to have been saying that he was afraid he might lose a third of the cabinet, John. It is fascinating, Jimmy, to hear the backstory behind these moments right. that we've all watched play out on TV and in public and to hear the backstory. So how does Bob Woodward describe the relationship between the president and some of those top aides. So I think that we have seen the president obviously attack people on Twitter when he gets angry. We've seen him go after Jeff Sessions. We've seen him go after John Kelly. But the level 
of his attacks is different. So, for example, we know that, according to the book, that he's called Jeff Sessions mentally retarded, a dumb Southerner. This is beyond the pale, I mean, e even by Trump standards. And the other thing that I think is even more shocking is what his closest advisors, Woodward is reporting on his inner circle. And just to go through a couple of those, uh, Woodward reports Chief of Staff John Kelly says he's an idiot and says the president's unhinged. Defense Secretary James Mattis says, according to Woodward, that the president has the understanding of a fifth or sixth grader. Former Secretary of State Rex Tillerson, according to Woodward, uh, confirms the report that we had heard earlier that he says after a meeting at the Defense Department that the president is, quote, an effing moron. And there's more. Former economic advisor Gary Cohen, according to Woodward, is quoted as calling the president a professional liar. And last but not least, John Dowd, the president's former personal attorney, according to Woodward, said that the president is 